What's up guys, welcome back. Today I'm gonna to analyze 10 popular dividend paying ETFs across 10 different metrics to crown the best dividend paying ETF, as well as a short explanation of what an ETF is and how it might be best for you. Now, inevitably somebody's gonna get down in the comments and be like, why not all of them? Well, yeah, you can get all of these if you want. You can get one, two, I'm just trying to analyze which one I think is the best. Full disclosure, I do not own any of these ETFs. I only own mutual funds and individual stocks. But when people ask and I wanna tell them what the best is, I had to do the proper research. And before you buy anything, you should do your own research as well. Definitely do not listen to a guy like me. I, I, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Before we dive into the metrics, guys, I wanna explain what an ETF is real quick for anybody that's new. ETF is just an acronym. It stands for Exchange Traded fund and what it is it's a collection of individual stocks that's put together similar to a mutual fund that you can buy all of these funds all at once how are they different than a mutual fund really the only difference is they trade like a stock a mutual fund the price is set at the end of the day for example vanguard's vtsax a total stock market index mutual fund right that price is set at the end of the day it's not live pricing there's some other things that go along with it but it's very, very similar to the mutual fund with that exception of the fact that you can buy and trade these like stocks. And they really appeal to a wide range from beginner to expert investor, but I think they're primarily focused on that beginner. Somebody that doesn't really know individual stocks or they don't have time or the research or they just don't want to look into buying individual stocks, this is a great opportunity to buy a whole bunch of great stocks that somebody else has determined which is good and put them all together. So by buying them, you diversify among different kinds of stocks. We'll see these ETFs, how many different holdings, which is how many stocks they have, as well as other things. So it's great for the beginner investor that wants to get their feet wet while they're learning about individual stocks, if that's the route they wanna take. And it's also great for somebody that wants to go into mutual funds. Like I said, I'll mention VTSAX again, but they don't have the minimum price. A lot of mutual funds have a minimum price to get in. VTSAX, I think right now, as of this recording, is like 3,000. Well, if you wanted VTSAX and you didn't have $3,000, you'd have to go with its ETF, VTI, to buy that and you'd only need how much that share price is going for at that time. Now let's analyze which one of those is the best dividend paying ETF because they do range among all different indexes from international to dividend paying to real estate. You can find an ETF in any sector. Today we're just talking about the dividend paying ones. All right guys, I'm gonna use a Google spreadsheet just to keep this a lot easier. Across the top, you'll see the 10 that I've chosen. These are the ticker symbols for both, for each guys. <laughs> They're really long to type out and they would have made it all messy. If you're not sure what one of these is, just Google this ticker symbol, it'll tell you exactly what it is. But we got SPYD, SCHD, DVY, SPHD, VYM, HDV, QYLD, VIG, SDY, and DGRO. I got these from a YouTube poll when I asked a couple days ago which ones you really liked. And I also just got them from doing basic searches on popular paying dividend ETFs. That's really how I established this list of 10. I could have made more, I could have made less, but I think 10 is gonna give us a nice framework and a bit of data that we can really compare all of them. Now the 10 metrics that I think are important, maybe these aren't important to you, and maybe you have other ones that are important to you, this is my opinion. Here's are the 10 that are important to me when I'm picking an ETF. We have expense ratio, okay? How much does it cost you to actually own this particular fund? The dividend yield, the assets under management, meaning how much money is actually in this fund and working for it. The years that the dividend has grown, how many holdings are in this company? How many stocks are in each fund? What percentage of that fund is stocks and not other things like bond and real estate and things like that? I think if for me personally at my age, I wanna see a high stock percentage. The turnover rate, how many times are they pulling stocks in and out of this fund? We want this number to be nice and low, right? We don't want that volatility of things coming in and out. Also for tax purposes, and that's what raises the expense sometimes, is when they're pulling funds in, getting them out, we have short-term capital gains there, so we wanna see a low turnover rate. The year established, I think that's really important to me. One, because to be called the best, you really need to be established. You need to know exactly what's been going on, also, the year established is very important to me because I think it's very critical for these funds to go through financial crises, 
right? If you've been around for just a couple of years, well, the markets have really been up and up with the exception of the last couple of months. So it's been really, really easy to perform well and not struggle over the last decade or so. So I really want to see a fund that's been around maybe through the 2008 crisis, even back to the dot-com bubble, if we can find one way back there. I don't think we will. But I think the year established is very important to look at when comparing everything and also the year to date return. Sometimes the dividend yield might be lower, but if they have a really, really good return, we'll see those offset each other just a little bit and we'll look at exactly how that works. Now guys, to find all of these metrics, I went to one website, Seeking Alpha. Guys, if you're gonna be doing research, please make sure you cross-reference on a couple different websites. Seeking Alpha has been pretty reliable for me, so that's the one I'm gonna use. And essentially what I did is I just went in and I just did like SPYD. I clicked it here. It gives you a bunch of different data here. I also went to its holdings to find out, you know, how many holdings it has. And some of these, we're gonna look at the top 10 holdings that they have. Also their dividend, this is where I found their CAGR, their dividend growth, and their dividend yield, things like that. So I'm not gonna go through each one on Seeking Alpha, but I just want you to know that's where I got all the data for this chart. All right guys, so here's the expense ratios for all 10 of those. I have to be honest. If you have a high expense ratio, I'm really, I can't consider you the best. We're gonna see that these range from 0.06% all the way up to, it looks like 0.39%. Now guys, what does that mean? Well, that means for every $10,000 that you invest, say in VYM, you are going to have to pay $6. That's it, $6 on 10,000, as opposed to $39 on 10,000. Now that doesn't really seem like that much, but when you start to get up into the 100,000 or even a million, you know, that's a major, major difference. And for these guys to be competitive, we see there's a lot of them that are in that 0.06, you know, so if you start getting up above 0.1 or higher in this particular sector, because depending where you are, the ETFs are going to be different. But for this particular graph and these particular types of stocks, it's going to be really, really hard for me to call one the best. Like QYLD, they have a 0.6 expense ratio. So for them to be considered the best, there needs to be other things that are happening that make this thing stellar, which is why I didn't immediately get them off the list. But like I said, we're gonna look at dividend yield, some other things. I'm going to start to break these down and, and eliminate some right off the bat so we don't have to keep them. I'll break them down to like seven or so. But let's take a look at the dividend yields to see if maybe those expense ratios, they offset themselves with a high dividend yield. So if we look at the dividend yield, like I just said with QYLD, they have a really, really high expense ratio, but look at their dividend yield. So that's that's why I can kind of keep this on the list because they have a really, really high expense ratio, but they have a really, really high dividend yield. Now for me, you know that I also believe that above seven is a little sketchy for me. So that's another strike in my opinion against QILD, but I wanna be fair, I wanna be unbiased. But what's really like not acceptable for me is if you have a high expense ratio and your dividend yield isn't that good either. Like take SDY for example, 0.35, that's a really, really high expense ratio for only a 3.1% dividend yield. I don't think I can really consider that the best at all. So I'm gonna get rid of these expensive ones right off the bat. Get rid of this one, delete column. Like I said, you can't be considered the best if you have that. I'm gonna leave QYLD because of its huge, huge dividend yield, and we'll see what happens. This one's pretty expensive too. We'll get rid of this one. So that breaks it down to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven now. So now let's take it, take a look at the assets under management. If I clear this blackout. So the assets under management, we're gonna see that there are they range from $25 billion up in VYM all the way down to smaller ones, once again, like QYLD. The five-year CAGR, guys, what this means is the percentage that the dividend is gonna grow after over five years. So we see that we have some companies that don't even have a five-year CAGR yet. Now what that means is they're just young. Now can you be young and the best? I, I don't know, but we're gonna keep them on there. But what we wanna see is the higher CAGR. We wanna see the higher, the better we see. SCHD has an, a great five-year CAGR at 10.49, all the way down to HDV, which is a low of 5.53. This is a great number to look at, whether you're looking at ETFs, stocks, it doesn't matter. This is a great metric to look at for any dividend paying stock. And it's something that I think is really, really important. If we look at the years of growth, guys, we see that once again, with a young company, it's really, really hard to have a lot of years of growth. And this is the year that they've grown their dividend over time. So VYM and VIG, they're up there in 10. SCHD, 
once again, right up there with the Vanguard funds with eight and all the other ones, like I said, young companies. If we look at the holdings, the amount of holdings is going to impact the volatility of this particular ETF, right? The more things we have in it, the less likely the one stock could really make something go up or down. So I like to personally see a lot of holdings, right? It keeps me more diversified. We love diversification, you know, and it keeps things nice and balanced. We see all the way up from VYM, they have a ton of holdings as well as DGRO, which is almost at 500, all the way down into the low range of like 70. As you can see guys, most of these are heavily weighed in stocks, right? That's gonna give them the best return. And also the stocks are gonna pay great dividends as well that are inside these ETFs. They range all the way up from uh, VYM, which is pretty much 100%, 99.99, all the way down to VIG, which is at 99.33. Turnover rate, guys, that, like I said, that's going to keep taxes down, and it's also going to decrease volatility, and it's really going to show stability inside that ETF. Once again, we got 0.7 is going to be the low. I like to see a low turnover rate, all the way up to 57, which is kind of high. It's kind of like an outlier for me. All the other ones are, all right, decent, not that bad. As I talked about in the beginning, I want to see some things that have gone through some struggles. So pretty much with the exception of the two Vanguard funds, those two Vanguard funds, they went through the financial crisis 2008, 2009, and they were able to handle through that. The other ones are kind of new, right? So, I mean, can I say that something like SPYD, which was established in 2015, can it be the best dividend ETF right now? Possibly, but it's hard. You know, it's got to be a factor in there. And then if we look at the year-to-date return, as a dividend stock, I'm not really too worried about the year-to-date return, but it's definitely something that we wanna think about. And you can see year-to-date, guys, we know what's going on in 2020 right now. All of these are down year-to-date. VIG seems to be the one that's surviving, hanging on the best. It is down 6%, all the way up to HDV, which is down almost 18%, 17.3%. All right, so these are all the stacks. Now, how did I rate these? Essentially what I did is I took all seven of these and I gave them each one, each metric, I gave a point score. Seven being the best, one being the worst, and then I summed them up, just like a competition. So here's essentially what that looks like. All these with the great ones, they got seven, they tied. Seven, seven, seven. And then this is really seven, six, five. This one was the next four, three, this would have been two, those ones tied. If I just look at another column real quick where there aren't so many ties, this is the best yield. So that's seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. So that's essentially what I did. Here's what the whole table looks like. And then essentially what I did is, is I just summed them up. When I summed them up, VYM came in with the highest score of 60. VIG, the other Vanguard fund, right behind it at 54. And the other one, SCHD, which I know is a popular one, came in third. And like for me, the numbers don't really lie if you look at it. And I know there's be some people that want to add metrics or take away metrics, which could skew this data. But for me, like I said, 10 across 10. I narrowed it down to seven. And even if we took just the top three, even if we took SCHD, VYM, and VIG and looked at just those top three, we could compare them and we could see like, back to the beginning of the video, like why not own all three of these? Yeah, you could, but I, I personally, I want to look at the best. If we look at the expense ratios, identical, you know, dividend yields. I think we can get rid of VIG there, especially when we're talking about dividend paying ETFs at 1.9. I like to say that three or better is really a dividend stock. So maybe three or better would be a dividend ETF as well. The assets under management, like I said, 11.4 to 25. If we look at SCHD versus VYM, I don't care. The CAGR 8.29, SCHD a little bit, bit, a little bit better there. The years of growth, 10 versus eight. Holdings, very different. Like they're very, very similar. SCHD and VYM, I think are the top dogs if we look at it. And there's really one last thing I would look at if I looked at SCHD versus VYM. And we all, like if I look at my YouTube poll from yesterday, 44% of people went with SCHD over VYM. And I can't say I'm surprised, maybe a little bit, but I think there's one last thing that's worth noting when we look at these two, SCHD and VYM. If I was going to decide which was best for me, I would have to look at what type of investor I am. And looking at their top 10 holdings, I think is a great way to do so. Right here is SCHD, and we can see this is a Schwab Strategic Trust, Schwab US Dividend Equity ETF. They are weighted very, very high in consumer defensive and industrials. 
where if we were to look at VYM, it's very different. They're big on healthcare, right? We see something like utilities, which is almost 10% of what Vanguard's fund is. Utilities is down to 0.02. So there's almost no utilities in the Schwab fund. So if utilities are important to you or if energy is important to you, energy is 6.66. If we look over here, we try and find energy. They have about the similar energies. I, tech is a big one right now for growth. Right now, VYM is based 11.5 uh 11.59 inside tech and technology in this one is 18.11 so i mean it's you can look at the holdings to see you know what weight you need maybe you have a lot of stocks that are really high in utilities so you wouldn't need an etf that was high in utilities because you'd have those in your stocks so this would be the last stop that i would go if i was deciding which is the best out of these two but if I'm going to crown a winner, guys, I think that this speaks for itself. I would probably go with saying VYM is the best dividend paying ETF right now. If you disagree, get down in the comments. I would love to hear your opinion. Is there one that I missed? Am I a complete donkey? Like I said, I'm open to constructive criticism and I'm always trying to learn. For more content just like this, guys, if you are new to the channel, consider subscribing. Hit that thumbs up if this video gave you some value or you enjoyed it. Until I see you guys on the next one, stay positive. Work really, really hard always. Be kind to other people. I hope you have yourself an amazing day, a great 4th of July weekend, and I'll see you on the next one.